Okay, well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from in the world. Uh, my name is Garrett Herning with HydroTest, and this is our second webinar. Uh, this is going to be kind of a series of webinars we're going to have now. Uh, the next two or three are going to be uh, all focusing on solenoids. So this is kind of the, the start, the first one on solenoids. So I guess just to start with, uh, can somebody just reply in the chat box there? Can you see and hear me okay? I want to see if someone can just uh, just reply. Make sure you can hear me okay. Looks like everything's good with the microphone, but I uh, just want to make sure. Okay, got the thumbs up. Uh, thank you, Carol. So, so let's get started. Uh, we're going to talk about solenoids, and, and solenoids are an interesting thing, especially in valve bodies. And what we're going to do is kind of start with the basics today. I'm not going to dig in real deep on some topics. I'm going to save that just because it's, it's a pretty broad topic. So we're going to kind of just start with more of the mechanics and the basics. What you're going to see with solenoids as you start getting into working with them if you're not familiar or if you are kind of the different things to look for. So let's get started. So what we're going to kind of cover here is first the different types of solenoids, then why you should worry about them, and then there's an argument to just replace them or reuse them, and then we're going to talk about some test methods and examples uh, with solenoids. So let's get started. So when we start looking at solenoids, let's talk about some of the mechanical characteristics. There's typically two different types of solenoids. There are on-off solenoids, and they do just that. They turn on and off. And then there's regulating solenoids, and they actually regulate pressure. And there's a mixture of these in all the different units that are out there, depending on the ones that you work on. Uh, the regulating solenoids are by far the most popular in modern transmissions now. The on-off solenoids are kind of going away, and they're not used for any of the, the primary shift functions as much anymore. Well, when you look at solenoids, they can either be normally opened or normally closed. And what that means is that has to do with the state of the solenoid uh, and flow going through it when it's off or not powered. So if it's a normally open and it's an on-off solenoid, it would let fluid go through, let pressure go through. Um, and if it's a normally closed, it would block that. And then when I energize it, it reverses that. When you get to a regulating solenoid, if it's normally open or normally closed, it depend it'll be either if it gives you high pressure when it's off or low pressure when it's off. And then as we adjust the current, it'll regulate that pressure up or down. So, and that's important to remember that with uh, normally open and normally closed. I think back to I had a, a customer that I was working with. They bought a, uh, a solenoid machine and were testing some of the A606-604 solenoid packs. And they were unaware that there's two normally open and two normally closed solenoids in there. And they had, I don't know, a couple hundred of these packs and they tore them all apart. They cleaned them all out. They put them back together and didn't pay attention to which one was normally open, which ones were normally closed and where they were supposed to go. And they were having all these problems. They were trying to test these packs and, and none of them were working right and they had mixed them all up. So. And they look very, very similar. I don't, I don't remember exactly what the difference was to tell them apart, but yeah, they had to take all these packs back apart, sort through all those solenoids, and they made a, made a pretty big mess. But they learned an important lesson there that there's normally open and normally closed solenoids, and it's important, especially in some of the different solenoid packs, they have to be in a certain spot. So uh, when we look at the different solenoids here, and I got kind of an array of them pictured here, uh, generally they'll have a feed port, an outlet port, or a working port and then an exhaust port. And it's an easy example here is in the upper right hand corner. This is a Honda solenoid. And you can see there's a port here on the end and it's separated with an O-ring. There's a port here, separated with an O-ring and there's a port here. So there's a definite where the fluid comes in, where the fluid comes out to apply your clutch or whatever 
element in the transmission, and then an exhaust port that's going to relieve any uh, oil that's behind the valve or whatever is in there. So, uh, and that's pretty pretty common. So you can kind of pick that out on all the different ones. You can see this Ford one here. There's some different ports and an exhaust up here. Same thing on this GM. And a lot of the solenoids, what they'll have is a screen on them to help filter any larger debris out so it doesn't get caught inside there. So you can see on uh, this one here, you can see there's screens here. This one here is pretty obvious. There's screens here. There's a little screen on the end of this one. There's a screen on the end of this one. So that's very common. And then depending on the design, they'll use either O-rings or just a real tight fit to kind of seal them. So you can see this one's pretty obvious. I've got O-rings here. And this being a Honda solenoid, will actually bolt on the outside of the transmission. So it has to be completely sealed, you know, with the fluid coming through this. So there's, you know, no leakage to the outside world where some of these that go right in the valve body, they'll just have the, the bore that the solenoid goes into uh, machined to a very tight fit with the solenoid. And that's what does the sealing. So... And just kind of different variety here. This is a ZF uh, shift solenoid here. This is a typical set of solenoids. It's in a 4R70W. That's still uh, an older but a fairly common unit here in the United States. Uh, this is a Honda solenoid. Uh, this is an Asian Warner linear solenoid. This is a, a GM uh, or an Allison 1000 out of a, a five-speed. That's one of the trim solenoids. And this is kind of your, your classic GM EPC off of any of the four-speeds. So uh, just kind of kind of get you a little bit familiar with some solenoids. And then just kind of talking about how they function. So this is kind of a breakdown of an on-off uh, ball and seat style solenoid. Um, and how this functions, and if you look at it, there's a, a ball and a seat that's here on the end of the solenoid. As you can see it right here. And basically this, this ball, it's a little like almost like a ball bearing, it presses up against the seat. And when you press it up against the seat, it blocks flow. If you let it go and it has some room to move in there, it lets flow go through. So, and what pushes on it is this little pin. So this whole assembly kind of goes together. And there's a spring in here that holds this pin back and lets this kind of, this ball kind of move around in there. So when this solenoid is off, it's normally open and it allows fluid to go through. When we energize the coil, we push all of this assembly and it pushes this pin up against the ball and pushes it against the seat and blocks the flow. Uh, so then flow can come in the sides here, but won't come out the end. Uh, and that's basically how that solenoid functions. So um, if you've never taken one apart, or, or if you have taken it apart, you didn't do it this carefully, you can kind of see how these elements all line up and how this works. Uh, and that's pretty basic. It's an on-off, and, and a lot of them are similar to that. If we get to a regulating solenoid, now this is, is interesting. This is a, an older style uh, GM EPC, but it's fairly common on any of the regulating or the linear or the pressure control ones. What we have, and if you look at this, this looks very similar to a valve in a valve body. Uh, there is a valve here, regulating valve. It goes inside this, I'll call this a snout. This is the end of the solenoid here. Uh, you set your screens here, my oil comes in and comes out, and this valve slides back and forth in here. Uh, just like a valve and a valve body to regulate pressure. And the coil has this assembly with a diaphragm that basically as I increase and decrease voltage, which would increase and decrease current, it moves this valve back and forth in there. And that's how we regulate pressure. I got uh, static pressure for the most part coming in, and then as I move this valve back and forth, I can regulate what's coming out. And that's kind of the basis of how most regulating solenoids work. Now some electrical characteristics of solenoids. Now a solenoid is a basically a very long piece of copper wire. And, and this picture kind of gives you an example, but it probably doesn't do it justice. I'm sure most solenoids are probably 10 to 100 times the length of this. It's very, very fine wire. Um, and wire has a resistance. Per foot or per meter, there's a certain amount of resistance to it. So the longer wire we have, the more resistance you have. And you have to remember that when we're measuring, say, the resistance of a solenoid, we're measuring the resistance of a wire. We're not measuring the resistance of a resistor. So if you think back, you know, one of the common ways that you would uh, control, say, in your car, the, the brightness of the dash or the indicating lights used to be a rheostat in there. You turn the little knob up and down, and the lights would dim a little bit if it was too light. And that was a big resistor. A resistor doesn't really change resistance with temperature. Uh, a piece of wire does, and it's noticeably. So if you do a resistance check on these at room temperature versus, say, if it was at uh, operating temperature, you would see a measurable difference in resistance. 
Um, now, on-off solenoids, typically they're a higher resistance. They're going to be in your 10 to 30 ohm range. And your regulating solenoids are a lower resistance uh, between 1 and 6 ohms. So you can see here this top picture, this is a regulating solenoid. I'm measuring about 3.5 ohms. Uh, on the bottom here, this is a shift solenoid. I'm measuring 26.6 ohms. Uh, so measuring the resistance of that wire. And that kind of has uh, follows into you know how much current the solenoid will draw when it's on. So the on-off solenoids generally will draw about a half an amp max. That's that's typically what they draw when they're on, and they're designed to be on all the time. That they can turn on and stay on in, in, indefinitely as long as you know because they're going to hold us in a gear if they're a shift solenoid. So as long as we're in that gear, uh, so they generally don't draw more than say I would say 0.7 amps would be the max. Uh, a regulating solenoid, uh, they're designed to draw a variable amount of current, and usually they'll max out at about 1.3 amps. So we'll, we'll regulate those, we'll, regu uh, we'll, we'll vary the voltage, which allows us to vary the current, which allows us to vary the pressure coming out, and that will be anywhere from 0 to 1.3 amps. Uh, one thing that you do have to be careful of, uh, especially if you're testing or working with solenoids, is there are some solenoids that are polarity sensitive. Uh, they'll have an additional diode in there in part of it and there's only a few units like that but you certainly don't want to reverse the power and ground on that because you will burn up that diode and you'll have a little bit of smoke that will come out and then that solenoid can now be recycled. So, uh, so keep that in mind. There's a, a few units that are out there that are like that. So now we got some basics on kind of the mechanics of the solenoids and, and measurements and stuff on them. I guess the big question is why should you worry about solenoids? Uh, just another part in the transmission, right? Um, well, solenoids, especially in modern units, are they control everything in the valve body. Okay? Nothing happens in the valve body anymore without a solenoid actuating it. It controls your different shift events. It controls how those shift events from gear to gear, how it feels. Um, and even in some of the late model units, they can override the manual valve. I remember uh, a few years back I was working uh, with uh, an acquaintance of mine, we were down at a reman, and he had a rental car and was kind of curious if he threw that into reverse or park while it was still moving, would it come to an abrupt halt or would the, the transmission in the computer be smart enough to not let it do that. So as we kind of came coasting into the, the, the hotel, he, he tried it, you know, it was a rental car, it's not his, that's what you do with rental cars. And uh, lo and behold, the, the car just came to a stop like you hadn't even moved the gear uh, shifter. So, um, so with the late model ones, they're, they're, they're smart enough the solenoids will actually override you know, whatever you're trying to do to it and, and protect the transmission and protect the valve body. So that was kind of interesting. So on the top here, I got a 4 lady picture. And I always kind of go back to this, this valve body and the solenoids on here. It's kind of controls 101. That was really kind of the basis of where... You know, that type of unit is the basis where all of the electronic transmissions came from. That's where we went to aluminum, you know, housings and castings for everything. And we have shift solenoids on here. We have one regulating solenoid. So very simple, but if you can kind of grasp everything on this one, you can grasp the, the later model stuff here. Uh, we look down to this one below it here. This is a 68 RFE, so a six speed that was fairly common here in a lot of pickup trucks in the United States. Um, this one's a much more complex unit. Uh, it's six speeds, not four. Uh, it's all clutch to clutch control. It's got a solenoid pack on it, and it's it's not as simple as this. So this particular unit here, this is where you have things like your shift feel and how they modulate all these solenoids to give those different shifts and how they work and how they feel, whether you're at low throttle or a high throttle, whether you're towing something, whether you're not. Um, there's a lot more complex stuff going on this one. And Solenoids, just like any other part in, in the transmission or in the vehicle, they can wear out, they can break, and, and that's why you need to worry about them. Because if they're broken or if they're worn out, you don't want to put them back in a unit that you're rebuilding uh, because you'll be pulling that unit back out or taking it back apart. And one thing that is interesting is solenoids are not always the highest quality part. Um, if you look at a, a couple of good examples I got, and we'll look at the, the Chrysler one here in more detail a little bit later on, but you know the Ford 6R60 or 6R80 is basically the same unit as a ZF6HP19. Uh, the difference on those units are the solenoids that are put on them. Uh, the ZF unit uses uh, ZF or probably Bosch solenoids, where the Ford unit uses Ford solenoids. If you take a Ford unit 
and you put the ZF solenoids off, or solenoids off of a ZF on there, it'll work fine in the vehicle, no problems. If you take the ZF unit and put the Ford solenoids on there, it won't shift, it won't uh, work well at all. And it, what it has to do is just the quality of the solenoid. Uh, the ZF unit, being a BMW, has a hot, higher quality solenoids in it, and the, the TCU in that vehicle has an expectation of how they work. Uh, the Ford solenoids are a lower quality unit or solenoid, and Ford has just done more on the programming side of it to allow a lower quality solenoid to work just fine uh, that, that isn't in there. So there is a marked difference in these two solenoids where if you have them side by side, they probably look fairly similar, almost the same, but, but there, there's a difference in quality there. Uh, Ford's a, a cheaper vehicle, um, where the ZF is a, probably a BMW, and people are demanding or have an expectation of a higher quality vehicle and they can get that price point when they sell it so they can put more into the solenoids. Uh, Chrysler RE series uh, governor solenoid. Uh, I worked with a reman several years back on, on these and it was amazing at how, I wouldn't say low quality, but how they varied from solenoid to solenoid. Now we were doing a high production style solenoid testing machine and they were testing a lot of these and one of the trip uh, points we had that was a little bit of an argument as we had 15 brand new solenoids they had gotten locally uh, from the dealer. We put them in the machine and we ran them three times each. And the readings were kind of all over the place. And the argument that I had from him was, well, your machine isn't reading very well. It's all over the place. It's not very consistent. We need to fix that. When we really took a look at the data we saw for you know the first solenoid, we ran it three times and the reading was almost the same. The second solenoid, we ran that three times. The reading was the same, but it did not match the first one. So as you looked at all of them, you could see that they varied from solenoid to solenoid. Each solenoid repeated itself, but there was quite a variation in uh, the readings at a given current for that solenoid. And I had to convince him that it's, well, these just aren't real high quality solenoids. They don't have to be with the way the control system works in the vehicle. And uh, the fact of the matter is you went to the dealer and you bought one. It was only a $70 solenoid. Uh, that didn't include the markup from the manufacturer, from the dealer, or anybody else along the way. So you had to think about how much was really put into that solenoid when it was brand new as far as cost. So, and we'll, we'll take a look at that Chrysler RE solenoid in a minute here. So when we talk about why you should worry about solenoids, I think this is a, an interesting graph to look at. This is a, a 6L80 unit, so it's another fairly common unit here in the United States. And this is a clutch-to-clutch -clutch unit. So all the solenoids are kind of directly tied to clutch elements in this, this particular unit. And so the solenoid, they're all variable pressure solenoids, they control every shift event. And you can see they control the shift event from this is neutral to first, first to second, second to third, and all the way up to six lockup. So if I have the solenoid that controls, let's see here, my three, five, and reverse, that's the blue line here. If I have a problem with that particular solenoid, you can see that is off here in first. It comes on as I go into third, then drops off into fourth, comes back on into fifth, drops off as I go into sixth. If I have a problem with that solenoid, or if it's not functioning right, or it doesn't have its, its pressure curve quite right, I'm going to have problems on my shift from two to three, my shift from three to four, my shift from four to five, and my shift from five to six, as well as I may have problems with it in third gear and in fifth gear. So that one solenoid can cause a lot of problems here. Now you think about how many solenoids are in this particular unit, and this is why we need to worry about solenoids. This is another interesting kind of a study I did a while back on this particular governor solenoid. It was when I was working with that particular reman in terms of wear on that. So if you look here, the blue line is a brand new OEM solenoid. And what you can see here is this is pressure. I had about 95 PSI going into the solenoid. And as we increase the current, you can see the pressure coming out of that solenoid drops. It's a nice smooth linear curve here. As we went back up, you see it kind of goes back up for, I'm not really sure why there was this little bump here, but it seemed to do it on all the different solenoids. But you can see it regulates back up, it comes back up to about 90 PSI. The red one was a used one, but it had fairly low mileage on it. You can see that curve is shifted over here, and it's shifted over here. But it matches the blue pretty good. If you look at the green one, this was another used one with relatively high mileage on it. 
uh, a lot of miles on it. And you can see that's the green curve and it's shifted way over on both sides of it. So what's happening in this solenoid? Well, we're seeing the effects of wear with mileage on it. This particular solenoid and this particular valve body is constantly moving around. It's what's controlling the one, two, three shifts or three, two, one or anything like that. So, you know, as you're driving that vehicle, it's controlling, you know, when I go from first to second, second to third and coming back down. So it's, it's constantly moving. Um, or not, maybe not constantly once I'm in lock up and overdrive, but every time I come down to a stop and start again and go, it's going to be moving around. So as the solenoid wears, you can see this graph is moving out to the right here and coming back to the left here. So this is another case of why I want to worry about solenoids, because if I'm rebuilding this unit, I certainly want to want to put this solenoid that made the green line back into there. Um, that's 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 a huge difference from the blue unit. You know, when this one finally starts to move, I'm at 0.4 amps where the new OEM one is. I'm down to less than half pressure with my control here. So um, kind of an interesting study to see the effects of wear on a solenoid. Now this one still controls okay, but there's going to get to a point where it's not. If it keeps shifting over, I'm going to get to a point where I'm never going to get back down to zero. It's just going to come down and kind of stop and, and, and that's it. So. And this is kind of a look inside that solenoid on, on what happens here. So this here on the left is the off position. So if I'm not uh, powering the solenoid at all, this regulating valve looks very similar to that one we looked at earlier that I had apart is all the way to the right here. Uh, my fluid comes in and it comes through and it comes back out. So pretty much what goes in is able to come out. If I go back, I can see when it's off, 95 in, I get 90 out. And then as I regulate and the coil, as I regulate the current to my coil, this valve moves to the left. So you can see here as this valve moves to the left, it kind of starts to block our inlet here and reduces that pressure coming out. And what happens is where these yellow lines are, where these arrows, that's where I start to see wear. And as that wears, it allows fluid to bleed through there. I need to move this further and further over to start to get that to regulate. So you can kind of see that really easily here. If you look at current is kind of proportional to the distance I have to move that. I have to move this farther and farther to block this or start to get that regulation to happen because I've got wear right here inside the solenoid. So if you look at that, that looks very, very similar to the same things you'll see in a valve body where in a valve body. But this is inside the solenoid. Aluminum housing, there's a valve moving back and forth just like wear in a valve body. But we're seeing it inside the solenoid. So, why don't we just replace all the solenoids? If we know that solenoids can wear and do wear, it's just best to replace them all, right? Then we don't have to worry about it. You replace them all and no problems. Well, you kind of got to look at the unit itself. So I did a little kind of a quick study here. I went to Transtar and looked up the price of solenoids for these two units. So a 470W. Again, this is an older unit, but it's still fairly common here in the United States, more common than I kind of expected uh, talking with customers, but there's still a lot of shops that do these. It's kind of, they'll see several of these a week in a lot of pickup trucks and stuff like that here in the U.S. So if you look at the cost, it's about $50 from Transtar for a set of shift solenoids, that's these two, and $75 for the EPC and the TCC solenoid. So a full set of solenoids for this unit costs you about $125. Now, when your customer comes in and you tell them, well, you can put all new solenoids on here, it's about $125, that's not too hard to pass on to them. Most people are going to say, okay, yeah, do that, that makes sense, that's not a huge amount. If you look at this AS68RC, so this was used in some of the Dodge, Chrysler, and uh, Nissan pickup trucks uh, for a few years, um, this one has eight solenoids on it. So it's a newer unit, it's a six-speed, and the shift solenoids, there's four of them are $360. The regulating solenoids, there's four of those, at $600. All of a sudden now, you're at almost $1,000 to replace the solenoids, all of them on this unit. I think you're going to have a little bit different conversation with your customer at $1,000 versus $125. 
that's going to be really hard to, to try and convince them, well, you need to drop $1,000, and we haven't even opened the unit yet. We haven't done any rebuilds. We haven't you know, replaced any of the other parts that could be bad. So this is where, in these later model units that have more solenoids, they're fancier solenoids, they're bigger, they're more expensive, uh, whether it's an OEM or even an aftermarket, they're all just more complicated than, than in, in, in these, some of these older units. It really starts to, to give you a case that maybe I only need to replace the ones that are bad. Uh, replacing them all is going to get very expensive and, and it's going to be hard to sell that to a customer. And you know, one of the things in working with some of the different remands, um, one of the things that we, we that they, they told me or the kind of the studies that they had done was generally on off solenoids and it makes sense because they don't move constantly. They last a very long time. A lot of them will last probably more than the life of the vehicle. Um, and with that one Chrysler remand that I worked with on those RE units, they had upwards of 60 plus percent was the recovery rate they were going to get on the on off solenoids. When they got down to the regulating solenoids, it was a much lower recovery rate. Um, but there is a difference between older units and later model units. So if you can do you know, a 60-ish percent recovery rate on the on off solenoids, that's not too bad. You're saving quite a bit of money up here. On the regulating solenoids, you know, older units had a few of them and they worked a lot. If you look at most of the four speeds, you had one regulating solenoid and it would constantly be moving to regulate pressure in that unit as a whole. On the later model ones, while you still have regulating solenoids, they're usually tied to just a specific clutch element. So they're only regulating as they're applying and releasing that element. So while there's more of them in here, they're doing a lot less regulating. So I would suspect that this percentage of recovery rate on the regulating ones is probably higher than it is on the older units. Um, so there's a really strong case that, you know, maybe replacing them all isn't the best option. Maybe the best option for you and the customer is to only replace the ones that are bad. Um, and that leads into, well, I need to find the ones that are bad or questionable. I want to make sure that I'm not putting any that are potentially bad or worn back on. I need to make sure that the ones I'm reusing are the good ones. Uh, one other slide I'll put up here, and this is this is kind of funny. Um, there's a story that goes along with this. Um, and I said, our new, you know, new solenoids are there guaranteed to be good. And you see this picture here, did your delivery guy do this with the boxes of solenoids that he brought, uh, you know, brand new ones, did he trip and fall and drop them? And, you know, any places that make solenoids, whether they're brand new OEM ones or aftermarket ones, you know, they have pretty rigorous testing standards uh, and, and they're high quality. A lot of them are ISO places, you know, if they put out a, a bad product, and, you know, you have two or three uh, transmissions that you put these brand new solenoids in from a particular vendor and, and you have problems with them. I mean, that place isn't going to be in, in business very long making solenoids if they don't make a quality product. So. I can't say that any of the the OEM or the aftermarket solenoids are really uh, bad at all. I think most of them are very good quality, um, but nothing's 100%, and there's always the potential for shipping damage. And I say this because there was one uh, reman I was working with, and they were actually a factory reman. They were right in the same factory as they were making the transmissions for the manufacturer. I'm not going to mention what manufacturer it was. And they bought the solenoid machine to, to test solenoids because they were doing a small remanufacturing operation. And what they were doing is they were taking units that failed under warranty that came back from dealers out, and they were trying to find out what failed in it to feed that back to engineering to improve the units over time. Uh, and the other reason they bought the solenoid machine was so they could test new solenoids. And that confused me. I said, well, why are you testing new solenoids? And he said, well, our guys in our warehouse, they tend to be uh, fairly speedy on the forklifts, and they will drop a pallet full of solenoids from time to time. And it happened often enough, what, what they would do is if they dropped that pallet full of solenoids, or that crate full of solenoids, they couldn't put them on new units, so they would just throw them all out. They would take that out to the dumpster and, and throw them out because they had no way of testing it. So now that they had the solenoid machine, they said what we can do is if they drop one of those pallets full of solenoids, we can test them all and make sure they're still good and, and reuse them. Uh, and I thought that was funny because I thought, well, the problem really isn't dropping, you know, the problem is more of the guys are dropping the solenoids in the first place. They shouldn't be dropping them. They shouldn't be, it sounds dangerous to me if they're moving around that fast, but that was one of the benefits that, that they said the machine was now. They could test these solenoids if they dropped them, but it's kind of food for thought. 
if this was an OEM saying, you know, if they drop them, now they're questionable. Um, if your delivery guy drops them, you know, I'm not saying you need to test every new one, but it's just an interesting story and, and, and kind of caught me off guard there. So, uh, you know, I can always, always think about that. So, testing solenoids. Uh, at HydroTest here, we offer the HT Soul. It's our flagship uh, solenoid testing machine. I've actually got two of these coming into our Wisconsin office today. Uh, unfortunately, both of them are sold, but we have some more that will be coming in after that that we're going to be bringing in for stock and things like that. And we'll have some uh, some, some videos and some pictures in the, the next uh, webinar where we'll be doing some actually testing in the machine. So I think as we get into some stuff uh, with more technical on the, the electrical side of that, it'll be great for you guys to see in the next webinar. So, But this is... Uh, you know, hydraulic testing is by far the most accurate and comprehensive way to test. Uh, there's ways you can test sometimes using air or some other ways, uh, but to really duplicate what the solenoid is doing in the vehicle, you need to hydraulically test it. Um, duplicate those same conditions uh, that, that it sees. So the, the HydroTest HC Sol is probably the easiest and most reliable machine on the market today. Uh, I know I've worked with some other manufacturers uh, about 15 years ago, I worked at Zoom Technology uh, with the Ansermatic line of stuff, so I'm very familiar with that. That was a, a good machine, uh, but definitely dated and is uh, you know no longer in production. Um, and, and really, the HT Sol kind of builds on the history of all those old machines. It does what those did, but it does it a lot better, especially with the graphing capability and the computer control that we have. You know, that really, I think, sets it apart from everything else. So, And it's a, a fairly small machine, fits kind of on your bench top, and is easy to use. So um, we have, you know, test blocks for all the common models. We constantly have some in development. Uh, we're actually working on three new applications right now for a customer that had some stuff that's that's really new. Um, so we're going to be getting some solenoids and valve bodies from them so we can uh, design blocks for them and we'll have them probably before, you know, out and ready to go before most anybody else uh, out there actually sees those in their shop. So we also provide uh, pre-written test scripts as a starting point for all the different solenoids. Uh, that you use in the machine in the block so you got something to start with and the software is really easy to use and you can do modifications to the scripts and you can write your own scripts so um, so really easy and then we also offer available uh, updates over the internet so all of the the laptops and stuff that come with it are programmed with team viewer and we can log in and do updates and do any kind of troubleshooting or work with you uh, if you have a you know an issue on that so just kind of a, a plug here for our machine we're very very proud of it and uh, it's, it's kind of the benchmark for if you're going to do solenoid testing and getting into it, uh, especially when you look at the costs of replacing, you know, new solenoids uh, in modern units today. So just kind of talking a little bit about testing with some of the solenoids. Um, you know, resistance check before you even drop a solenoid in a machine. Uh, the first thing you want to do is do a resistance check on a solenoid. That's the easiest thing to do. Grab your multimeter. Um, and if it's greater than 10 ohms, it's an on-off solenoid and what you'll see here is ones that, that have problems if you have an open circuit uh, you don't measure any resistance it's a broken coil you know it's a long piece of wire inside the solenoid and if it breaks either usually it's at the end where it connects onto the the, the terminals uh, obviously it's not going to work or if it has a, a low resistance it could be shorted it's a long piece of wire it's got a varnish over it to insulate it but you know, if, if it's not wound tight or if there's a way it can move a little bit in there, it could actually rub through that varnish and then you get a, a partial short in it. So um, there's specifications for all the different solenoids and usually what they should measure about for resistance at room temperature. And you want to be in that range. If you're, if you're low on that, that could be a problem with that. Uh, on-off solenoids are designed to handle ignition voltage indefinitely. So they'll draw, you know, 0.4 to 0.7 amps when they're on. And, uh, you know, they should open or close with ignition voltage. So when you have them in the machine and you turn them on, they should close, they should open. And one of the biggest things to look at when you're testing on-off solenoids is they should shut off when they're supposed to. Whether it's normally open or normally closed, they should close. There shouldn't be any leakage. If you get wear on that ball and seat or if that uh, seat cracks, you're going to see some leakage through there and they won't fully close. They won't fully shut off. You know, when they're supposed to block flow, it should block flow 100%. You shouldn't see any leakage through there. So that's probably the biggest spot where we see on-off solenoids failing is where they fail to close all the way, either due to wear or a crack. Um, you know, as you saw, this one here was the snout was made of plastic. So you know, what's 
you know, the heat cycling on off of that unit, especially if you're, you know, where I, I live here in the United States, you know, we get to well below zero in the winter, uh, and, and you can't park your car outside, so you have to think about that, you know, that car is well below zero, you start it up, you drive it, it gets up to, you know, 200 uh, or so degrees Fahrenheit, and then you park it, and it sits, it comes back down in the winter, you know, that's quite a heat cycle on that plastic, so, you know, over time, how does that affect it, so. When we start looking at regulating solenoids, uh, a little different here, resistance check again is a good thing to do. Uh, these are generally less than 10 ohms. Um, and I say you also need a good multimeter to be able to test that. So whenever you're testing these solenoids, they're fairly low resistance. And not every multimeter can measure down to a few ohms. Uh, most of your inexpensive ones can't do it at all. So you need to make sure you have a good multimeter that can actually measure down to a few ohms. And uh, same thing applies to these as applied to the on-offs. If you have an open circuit, you could have a broken coil. If you have a really low or it's shorted, you can have the same thing in there um, you know, when you check that. So that's kind of your first check when you're working with solenoids. Uh, these are designed for a variable voltage and a variable amount of current. They're not designed to handle ignition uh, voltage across them 100%. Um, they're usually they're not going to draw more than about 1.3 amps. That's the maximum amount that they'll draw. So you have to be careful when you're testing these. You don't just hit them with full, you know, 12 or 14 volts um, and leave them on because you'll sit there and they'll get hot and you'll you'll cook them and you could potentially damage, you know, the coil. They'll get so hot. So um, and on these, your output pressure is proportional to current. You know that's how they work. As I vary my voltage, I increase my current. I decrease my current. And as I do that, that increases or decreases my output pressure. You know, depending on if it's normally open, does it start high pressure and go down to low? Or if it's normally closed, does it start at low pressure and go up to high? So, and these are kind of a, a nice sample of some of the more uh, modern ones here. This is an Asian Warner solenoid here. This is a Toyota, I think, out of a U660. Here's a solenoid out of a Ford uh, 6R140. So a very, very common unit here now. We're getting a lot of calls on this one. This is out of a 5R110, the predecessor to that. So, And you can see there's all different shapes and sizes of these. Um, the, but if you kind of go back to those first couple slides where we were looking at the, the EPC solenoid, I mean, it looks very similar. You can see there's a valve inside here. Here's a snout, kind of similar to that. There's a valve inside here. There's a valve inside here. Um, and that valve is moving back and forth. So, you know, it can potentially wear just like that, but just different shapes as far as what they're trying to do, you know, in the vehicle. You know, some of these here, since they're tied directly to clutch elements, the size of this valve and the volume of fluid it can move through is probably matched to that clutch element. They want to be able to apply that clutch element, you know, at a certain rate, whether I'm at a, a light throttle or at a heavy throttle, and I want to have the volume of fluid that can go through this and regulate through this solenoid to kind of match that for their programming. So. So when you're testing it, you want to be able to duplicate those same things. So if we look here, um, this is a graph off of our HT salt. Uh, so the dotted line is our target, and the solid lines are our actual, what we measured on this uh, solenoid. One of the most important things whenever you're doing any testing, and this goes with valve bodies, but it goes with solenoids as well, is you need to pick and maintain a test temperature. If you don't keep the same temperature when you're testing, you know, if you do your, your master or your the one that you're recording that's a known good at one temperature and you drop the temperature in the machine, say 10 degrees, and test at that, you're probably not going to get the same graph. Um, in fact, I know you're not going to get the same graph. Uh, number one, if you change that temperature, you're changing the resistance of the solenoid because remember, the coil changes resistance because that's a coil of wire with temperature. Um, you're also changing the viscosity of the fluid, and, and it's, a, it's an inconsistent test because your conditions weren't the same. Uh, you always want to make sure your conditions are the same. So your conditions for how you're powering the solenoid is the same, and your conditions for your test temperature is the same. And even the fluid you use in the machine. You always want to use the same fluid. You don't want to put ATF in at one time and then pull it out and put some kind of gear oil in another time. You know, if you use a different fluid, you're going to see a different reaction on that solenoid. But temperature is, is key. Always pick and maintain that test temperature. And when you test, you want to make sure you have that solenoid up to that temperature. Um, drop it in the machine, and if it's cold and you don't have enough fluid having gone through to warm the solenoid up, it, it's not hot. So you may need to run it a couple of times before you do your final graph to get it up to temperature. Um, when you're testing regulating solenoids like this, you should see a smooth change in pressure as your current increases. So on this graph here, the blue line is my current. 
So I'm ramping my current up, 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 up. When I get to here, I jump up to a higher current, I jump back down, and then I regulate that current back down. Um, as you can see, here are my green lines, the pressure comes up, 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 levels out, and then does the same thing on the other side. Okay, I see this nice smooth change in pressure up and down. That's key on any of these regulating solenoids, how they should function. I shouldn't see any dead spots. I shouldn't see this come up and then as I decrease current it stays and stays and then all of a sudden snaps and drops down. Uh, I shouldn't see it where it jumps up and down as I'm going up. Um, so if I hold this thing at a static current, say I bring it up here to about 0.4 amps, I should see it hold pressure very steadily. It shouldn't uh, sit here and wander around 10 or 15 psi. Um, so that's important. And the biggest thing is that solenoid should repeat. So at a given amount of current, I should always get the same pressure. It should overlap itself if I run a graph after graph after graph. And, you know, as the regulating solenoids as they were, what will happen is I come up in pressure. So if I look at this 0.4 amps here, uh, I'm seeing about oh, like one and a half bar here. So when I increase, I'll see about one and a half bar. When I come back down, I should get fairly close to that one and a half bar. As the solenoids do start to wear, you'll see that they'll, this difference between as I'm coming up in current and coming down in current will start to increase, and that's called hysteresis. So if I want low hysteresis, it would, or if I had no hysteresis, that value would be exactly the same. Um, it's not always going to be, you're always going to get a little bit of hysteresis, um, but generally it shouldn't be a lot. You know? And the easiest way to kind of see that is when you use our machine here, you can see I got a graph. And this solenoid here actually didn't match the graph, so this would be a questionable solenoid. But this dark green line or the solid line should lay right over the top of this dotted line uh, if the solenoid matched that. You can see this one here, it came on a little bit late, so maybe we got some wear here. I had to have increased amount of current. Think back to that governor solenoid we were looking at where that graph was shifted on there on those ones at high mileage. And it starts to drop off here, so it's, it's not matching that. And then it's also having trouble hitting that, that maximum uh, amount here. It's overpressured coming out, so it, it could have some wear in there where it's not regulating and, and chopping that pressure off. So. Um, so this here is the easiest way to see, you know, if I have this known good, this graph should lay over the top of it. So Now, the one thing is there are adjustments on some solenoids, and that's where we get into uh, this right here. So... Uh, Back in the day, you know, I, I talk about that, that's the older GM EPC solenoids. This actual screw on the back, you could turn this in and out. And when these units first came out and there was a problem with them, you know, I remember seeing this or guys talk about this. They said, oh, you just drop the pan and you give this about a quarter of a turn counterclockwise and it'll fix the problem. And what that does on this unit is it basically shifts that graph. You know, kind of like you had saw on the uh, that governor zone as it wore that graph shifted over turning this actually does the same thing it shifts that graph over and the problem was is back in the day you know that this would fix it for a little while and then and then it would and, and really what it was is you had valve body issues but you would kind of fix it by just turning this in a little bit and then it would ha start having trouble maybe a few months later so they would take it to another shop and, and by the time you know that, that they finally took it to a shop that said you got to pull the unit out you may have had three different people that had turned this screw so you don't have it a quarter of a turn you have a three quarters of a turn or maybe a full turn in and this solenoid is, is way off now it's not set where it needed to be so you know when I was at Zoom we would tell customers drop these in make sure you record a known good one and adjust this back so it lines up Okay. Make sure it falls back on top of the graph because you never know how many people had maybe turned this. And then make sure it follows that. It should be a smooth increase, a smooth decrease. You know, make sure it's not worn. So I don't know if those were specifically meant to be adjusted. They usually were adjusted from the factory. Um, but that was kind of something a lot of guys did. And I think the Ford ones of that same era had an adjustment screw, but it was set and then it was tack welded in. So you, know, you could break the tack welds and do that, but it wasn't really meant to be adjusted. Uh, we get to these later model Asian Warner ones now. These have an adjustment screw on the top here. And this is actually very critical on these. They do have to be adjusted. They are calibrated if you buy ones from the dealer or from the, an OEM one. Uh, but um, if you're putting these in, uh, if these aren't adjusted and have that curve that lines up over the top of it for the particular position they're in, um, they will cause issues in the vehicle. So, you know, we offer an actual plate for testing um, the valve body in our valve body machine where you can go in and you can run a sequence that goes through and, 
and moves uh, each one of these, ramps them up and down, so you can adjust them and, and dial those back in to match those. Uh, same thing if you're doing individual ones on the solenoid machine, uh, you're going to want to be able to do that to match that pressure versus curve. If it's off, that curve is off a little bit and it doesn't take a lot, um, these will cause issues in the vehicle, throw codes and it won't shift properly. And all it is is just dialing these in so that pressure curve lays over the top of it so that this lines up exactly for the different solenoids. And like I said, they're not the same for solenoid to solenoid. They're all a little bit different. Um, so. so that kind of wraps up this web webinar. We're right at 45, uh, 46 minutes. So we kind of got some familiarity with the different types of solenoids. Uh, we kind of went through and, and under, tried to understand, you know, why it's so important. And I think if we go back to that, that graph I had of the 6L80 where you see how those solenoids control every little function of each gear shift and all of the, the you know, the gear shift between gears as I go from one gear to the next. Um, it, it controls everything in that valve body. So one bad solenoid or one questionable solenoid in there is going to cause a lot of problems in that transmission. Uh, so that's the, you know, why are solenoids so important? You know, they're kind of the key to the valve body. They control everything. You know, they're the master, you know, switch that allows everything to happen. Um, and then really, if we start looking at the cost of these, you know, the cost benefit of replacing or reusing them. You know, uh, replacing all solenoids is very, very expensive. If we can reuse ones that are in there that are fine, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, we can save you and your customer a lot of money. Um, but the key is, you have to be able to find which ones are good and which ones are bad. And we can do that by using uh, our HT Sol, you know, a hydraulic test method uh, to test these solenoids. Um, and that's where you can uh, really save a lot of money, but the, the key is to be able to use it properly and understand how to use it. So, uh, so that kind of wraps up the webinar for today. Uh, our next one, when we get into cell noise, we're going to talk and really get into a little bit more of doing some actual testing on a machine and looking at how they kind of control the solenoids. Um, you know, when I say we vary the current, you know, what's the method by which they do that and why do they do it that way? Um, you're not just kind of dialing it up like up and down on a power supply. It's, 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 it's a whole method to that, pulse width modulation and why they do that. So we'll kind of get into that to give you kind of a better familiarity with the electrical side of things and what's really happening in the vehicle. And then we'll play around with a few things and, and kind of show you, uh, you know, properly ways to test the solenoid versus an improper way. So uh, I think it'll be interesting uh, for that. So we hope that you see you on the next webinar. And just some follow-up things. If you have an idea or a technical problem that you've worked through that you would like to share with us for an upcoming webinar, please let me know. Uh, this is my email address. Please reach out to me. Uh, also, we will be at the, the ATRA's uh, virtual powertrain expo on November 11th to the 14th. Uh, I think they're going to have a, a place you can log in and schedule a time to come and talk with us. Uh, so that'll be, again, November 11th to the 14th. We're going to have virtual booth 531. So uh, if you're able to, to log in and, and, and see this video, it shouldn't be any more difficult to log into that. So, uh, you know, register for the ATRA show. It's unfortunate we can't see you guys all face to face this year, but just with the whole COVID crisis and everything, this is, this is how we're going to have to do it this year. Um, but it'll be good because you can talk to us one on one and we'll have some pictures and some videos and some stuff for the machines available as they kind of wrap up that uh, platform that we're going to use. And then again, if you have any questions on our equipment, if you're looking at getting into solenoid testing or valve body testing, uh, reach out to us. So for I handle the U.S. and Canada for sales, so this is my telephone number and this is I, my email. Uh, Sam generally handles a lot of our international stuff, so this is how you can get a hold of them over there uh, in the U.K. and over in Europe. So uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the webinar today. Uh, look for your feedback. Uh, I guess before I, I, I hang it up here, does anybody have any questions, any slides you want me to go back to, uh, anything you want me to cover in a little more depth or explain a little bit better? Um, I guess just shoot a question out. Uh, I'll wait here a little bit because it generally takes about 30 seconds for uh, uh, the video to catch up to where I'm at right now. So uh, give you about 30 seconds to just, uh, you know, type me some questions or any comments you have also. a few things on the chat window there that might be faster. Let's 
So while I'm waiting here, I'm going to kind of go back to this one slide here. I just think this is really an interesting an interesting slide here where you can see you know there's the different shifting gears in this particular valve body and how you have uh, you know I think five or six or four or five solenoids that control everything that happens here and how critical these solenoids are to, to functioning properly that that controls everything in this valve body and just when you look at this blue line where if I have one solenoid that applies and releases this element how it can cause so many problems in this valve body just one solenoid so and you can see it here you know it not only can you know causes problems with the actual gear being on but how it gets to you know from off to on and drops it back off it's controlling this ramp rate coming on coming off coming on coming off so you know, very interesting so okay well if there are no questions or any other comments I think we will wrap it up for today. Um, oops. And again, we will have another webinar probably in about a month or so. Uh, we'll have to see when we schedule that because we got the ATRA show in there as well, so we don't want to overlap on that. Um, and I hope that uh, you know you guys can kind of log into that and, and, and see us and visit us. So again, let me just put this last information up here. So you have that if you have an interest in contacting us. So I'll leave that up there for about another minute. And uh, hope to see you guys again at the next webinar. So uh, thank you for joining today. You know, it's a, an hour out of your day, but we really appreciate it. And I hope you got something kind of useful out of this. Um, and again, we're going to have a couple more webinars are going to focus really on solenoids and solenoid testing so we'll we'll keep digging through some of the more technical information on this in the next couple of webinars and and give you something that you guys can really use and um, benefit you you know in what you're seeing from day to day so okay well thank you